Well, how much twist is too much twist? <laughs> twist and shout on this episode of Ron Spomer Outdoors podcast. Hello, everyone. Say one of our patrons on Patreon is asking me about excessive twist. He wants to increase the twist rate of some of his rifles so he can shoot those long high BC bullets, but he's a little bit worried that he won't be able to stabilize safely the really short lightweight bullets. And I get this question a lot and I even ponder it myself from time to time. So I will respond with a little bit of my experience, which backs up my claim that being too fast of the twist is sort of like being too pregnant. It's one or one or the other. You either are, you aren't. I just don't understand how you can have a stabilized projectile suddenly become unstabilized. Essentially, we're looking at a top as a, what a bullet is. It spins like a kid's toy top. So if you spin it fast enough, that thing is going to stabilize until it slows down and slows down and slows and then it fall, wobbles over. But I've never seen a top wobble over because you spun it too fast. So what's the problem with fast twists and short bullets? I think it's the bullet blowing up is what a lot of people worry about. And that might be legitimate. Let's just read the question here from Jarrett. He says, hey, I've been a while since our last conversation, but now I'm curious. Let's say the uh, twist rate on your 220 Swift is one in eight. Will that twist, um, with that twist, what will be the smallest bullet you could shoot before you blow the bullet up? Here we go. Seems like a trade-off for sure. With lower twist, you can kick out those light bullets at record speeds, but you can stabilize the high BC bullets. But you'll be all, um, all sorts of inaccurate at range. So he's got a lot of questions here. I guess in a roundabout way, my question is, when selecting a tighter twist on a custom barrel, how much are you limiting yourself with what bullets you can put down range? I was looking into the 22 Creedmoor, as you mentioned, but dang, I saw that some of them have a 1 in 7 twist. So does that limit my use to just high, long BC bullets? So there we have it. Yes, you are correct, I think, on the spinning apart. I've seen that many times or heard about it, read about it. You get a frangible varmint bullet with a really thin jacket and then a pure lead core. And A, it's going to be heated up going down the barrel from the friction. A little bit from the temperature of the powder, but that happens so quickly that it really doesn't have time to absorb that temperature. Uh, so it's getting to be a softer lead because it's hotter, but it also is spinning so quickly that it's just like like gravy or pudding on a spatula. When you spin it, you're going to throw that off and have enough cohesion to stay together. And I think that's what happens or at least is reported on some really frangible bullets that are spun too quickly. But I have also read that the optimal spin rate for any bullet is a certain twist rate, and the shorter the bullet, the slower. They claim that for precision target shooting, the minimum twist rate you can get by with for that particular bullet generally makes it the most accurate. But I think what we're talking here are ten thousandths of an inch or hundredths of an inch in difference in your group sizes. Don't think it applies to hunting at all. I think it's a tiny thing, but it just does seem that the, the shorter flat-based bullets need a slower twist rate, and then there is an optimal one for that. But when you consider the sizes of bullets that you can stabilize adequately, think of the 30 calibers. One in 10 twist is generally the standard for the 300 Magnums and the 30 out 6. And of course, the 30 out 6, everyone knows that's so versatile because of all the different bullet weights you can shoot in it. And they go down as light as 100 grains to 220 grains, sometimes even 230 can be stabilized in that one in 10 twist. That is a huge expanse. And it suggests that, yes, you're not going to overstabilize the shorter bullets. But then again, with the velocities of a 220 Swift, faster twist rate means you're increasing the RPM of the bullet and you can exceed the cohesion of the lead and the thin jacket. That lead can be be thrown out by centrifugal force with such energy that it tears the jacket and or the jacket is perhaps torn by the rifling to a large degree. At any rate, those bullets never reach the target. They just kind of ex explode in the air or something. So I would be concerned about that. Now, in my personal experience, the 
worst I ever did on this was I took a one and eight twist barrel, 22, 250 Ackley improved driving some tiny little 40 grain spear hollow point varmint bullets at 4,000 feet per second and did not spin apart. And the group on the paper was 10 shots under minute of angle, right about minute of angle. And I wasn't particularly concentrating on shooting a great group with it. I was just fire forming some brass and a little bit interested in the group size, but was nothing special that I did to try to shoot a really top-notch group. So that suggested to me that going down to a 40 weight bullet in a 22 caliber like that with fast twist barrel is entirely possible. So I guess the bottom line is I wouldn't worry about it too much. Um, and if you're thinking of having a varmint style rifle for shooting fast and far with a lightweight bullets, don't get one with a fast twist rate. But if you want a versatile rifle that will handle everything, and you think you can you probably do pretty well. You just have to decide, do I want to maximize my precision and accuracy with the really long, high BC bullets that need the fast twist? Or do I really need those bullets at all? I mean, if you do, if you want to shoot, say, a 90 grain bullet out of a 22 caliber, you'd better have your twist to handle that. Or there's no point. <laughs> in the whole exercise, whereas you can then move down the scale and just find out how well you do with those shorter bullets. That's the way I would handle that one. Cool. Now, here's one from uh, from Ken that's a little bit off the usual ballistics topics here, but I think it it really plays into what we talk about here because ultimately it's the hunting and the meat and, and the dining that we enjoy from all of our efforts. That's why we're, we're discussing the ballistics and the best cartridges and all the rest. And his point is about eating. He says, hey, Ron, have you ever looked into bone broth? doesn't seem like much of a breakfast, but hey, it's amazing the way it makes uh, use of the animals, all of it. After we... Um, get our bones, we cut them, and then we do a slow cook to get the broth. And then I refrigerate the leftover broth, and I use salt and pepper in the morning after heating it up. He drinks it, apparently. And he says his kids love it. It's usually from moose and caribou. And I responded and said, you know, I would never really tried that because when I'm moose hunting, I don't bring the bones out. I don't want to backpack all that weight. So, and most of my hunting has been backpacking way back in the middle of nowhere. So I've never brought out the moose or the caribou or even the elk and tried that. And with whitetails and mule deer, my experience has been with the fat on those animals that leaves a really, uh, what I would call a bad aftertaste. It's kind of a waxy feel in your mouth and it's got some off flavor to it. I have never had venison that did not taste good if I took all the fat off. So I just assume that the fat in the bones would do the same thing and I never tried it. So maybe it doesn't. And I am asking everyone out there, have you tried making broth out of whitetail and mule near bones, as well as elk, caribou, moose, and the other deer. Which ones are good? Which ones don't have a gamey taste? Is Ken right? Uh, apparently he is. His kids like it. His family eats it. I do know that broth is supposedly really nutritious. And of course, I've eaten it in soups. You always talk about adding chicken broth to uh, noodle soup, chicken noodle soup. And it enriches it and really improves the flavor. And the same with beef broth. And you can buy it commercially. You can find it in boxes and cans and powder form and everything else. So it does sound like a good thing to do. And I'm going to try some of that with my next moose or caribou. And if I get the right feedback, I might try it with my white tail and mule deer. So I would sure like to hear from you folks. What do you know about broth and making it? As much as I knew you just boil for a long time with the bones open. I think you have to cut them open so you can get that marrow fat that's inside. Um, I know our ancestors used to just cherish that stuff. It was high in nutrition and energy, and it's supposed to be really good for you too. So anyone out there who has good, good medical information on that, write in and let us know. But I think it's definitely worth listening to Ken here and trying some of that broth from the bones of the critters we take. And I bet you could do it with turkey pheasants all the game birds as well cool all right now let's see what the team has come up with for some new questions coming in on our various channels and blogs and such what do we have here this is from zane and i can tell you that zane has got an address in africa and it's always fun to hear from folks in other countries simple question why do hunters in America shoot does? <laughs> Why hunt does? Well, one, they're meat. 
I mean, hunters have always hunted whatever animal they could get for meat. We only stopped hunting females when we realized that there was so much hunting pressure, so many people hunting a limited resource that we needed to reduce the harvest of the females to keep the population up. But over here, we got in trouble, especially with whitetail to a lesser degree mule deer in that we were taking so many bucks that the sex ratio was so skewed and the does were still producing fawns and the population kept getting higher and higher until the understory was essentially eaten right down to the soil levels and you would see a browse line in the trees and it was simply an overpopulation. And the only way you can really reduce a population is to remove the productive machine, <laughs> which is the female. And since a, a buck and or bull can breed many, many females in a year, it just doesn't help to keep hammering the bucks. So you have to shoot the does to keep those populations in check. Now, in an intact ecosystem with all of the big predators, you probably don't need to do it, or at least as much, because the lions and leopards and cheetah and wolves and everything would be taking enough of the does to balance that population. But you know what it's like on the planet these days with humans and all their interactions with the world and changing the landscape and stuff. It's gotten skewed quite a bit in a lot of areas. And oftentimes, the only really way you can effectively control the population to a sustainable level, in, and that means for other wildlife too, that utilizes the resources that the deer are consuming, you do need to hunt some does. So yes, we do regularly for uh, regulation of the population sizes, hunt does and cows in different populations. Okay, this is a quote. Oh, got more questions from over the old big water here. This is from Ireland. Michael asks, um, cartridges, bullets, hunting, hey, Ron, with all that long high BC bullets coming on strong. Well, what do you think of the 220 Swift with a fast twist barrel shooting 70 to 90 grain bullets? Does it make sense? Bring some of the greats back into the action. So this guy wants to bring the 220 Swift back into action, which is, I think, a good point. That's a heck of a cartridge, still one of the fastest ones ever commercially produced. So what happens if you could... Increase the twist rate from the normal 1 in 14, maybe 1 in 12 that you get in factory rifles. Crank that baby up to stabilize a 70 to, to a 90 grain bullet, which we have these days thanks to the uh, the Creedmoor, the 22, or the uh, the Nosler, 22 Nosler, pretty fast twist. And then the, the uh, Valkyrie from Federal, that one was twisted really fast. Now, I have played around with the 22 250 Ackley Improved. And that one I got in a seven and uh, in one and eight twist, and I have stabilized 75 grain bullets in it beautifully. Haven't tried anything heavier. I'm sure it would stabilize the 80s. Uh, but I think for a 90 grain bullet, you probably need get the certain 90 grain bullet. I think we all need to remember we're talking length here, not weight. It's just so convenient to talk about weights, but a stumpy round nose flat based 90 grain is going to stabilize with less twist than a boat tail long tangent secant over jive pointy nose bullet. You know what I'm talking about. It's the length of the bullet that makes it difficult to stabilize. But at any rate, if you get down to about a one in seven twist, you can stabilize the longest 90 grain high BC bullets I think that we have on the market today. What do you end up with? The 220 Swift. Given that that 220 Swift will go over 4,000 with the lighter bullets, uh, my 2250 AI will do a 75 grain bullet at 3350 feet per second, if I remember right. So I'm going to say that 220 Swift, you can probably easily get 3,000 to 3,100 feet per second with a 90 grain bullet, certainly an 80 grain. Now, what does that remind you of? Let's see, a 90 grain bullet going 3,000 feet per second, 243 Winchester. How effective is that on pronghorn, deer? Pretty darn defective, right? Now, this 22 bullet is going to weigh the same, going to go at the same velocity, so it should be carrying the same energy. But at downrange, it will carry more energy because that bullet being a 22 caliber instead of a 24 is going to be a lot more aerodynamically efficient. It won't waste energy to air drag. So it also have a higher SD, sectional density, which means it should penetrate all things being equal in the construction of the bullet, should penetrate better than that 243 bullet at 90 grains. 
So yes, I think it's definitely viable, Michael, <laughs> and it would be fun to try, and I hope that you do. I, I know I still enjoy the heck out of my 22250 AI with those 75 grain bullets. Haven't really had an, any need to try the 80 and 90 grains, but I just might do it someday just for the fun of it because I think it does make an awfully good uh, medium to long range pronghorn and deer cartridge. So good question there. Fun to entertain that one. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this one's from Sweden. What is this, International Day? <laughs> Marcus from Sweden asks, Hey, Ron, I recently bought a Remington 700 in 270 Winchester. Before that, I had the boring old 308 Winchester. Uh-oh, here come the mail. <laughs> the hate mail's coming. And as far as I have concluded, the 270 Winchester is superior in almost all aspects except bullet weight. What is your opinion? Best regards, Marcus. Marcus, you're trying to get me in trouble here, but that's okay. I have been in trouble with the 308 Winchester crowd for a long time. Uh, I'm afraid you're right, Marcus. Now, let me put a caveat on there, or perhaps several. Obviously, the 270 is going to shoot faster than the 308 with the same weight bullet because it has more powder capacity. The 270 is the 30 at six neck down, but the SAMI specs give it more pressure, 65,000 PSI versus 60,000 in the 30 at six. And the 308, I forget what that is. That's about 60,000 or 62, 62,000 for the 308. That helps the 308 come a little closer to matching the performance of the 30 at six. But the 270 is shooting a narrower bullet. So if you have a 150 grain bullet in each of those, the 270 will be driving it faster. That means it's going to drift less in the wind, not drop as much, carry more energy downrange. Bingo, there's your winner. But as you also said, with the 308, you can step up to 160, 170, 180, even a 200 grain bullet. You don't find many factory loads with 200 grain bullets, but they're out there. And what a lot of people like with the heavier bullet is close range thump. Um, not every heavier bullet in every cartridge does produce more muzzle energy. We always think they do, but if you start to look at the numbers, you realize that there's a point of diminishing returns and you can push a heavier and heavier bullet, but it's get to the point where it is so excessive for the available powder supply that you cannot match the energy of a lighter weight bullet going at maximum velocity. So there is that. But those heavier bullets have momentum. And that's what the moose, bear, elan, kudu, the bigger animal hunting crowd wants is momentum so that that bullet continues for deeper penetration. And of course, that gets to the sectional density argument. You're going to get a higher sectional density out of that 270 bullet of the same weight. But then again, sectional density doesn't mean what it used to mean because of all the new kinds of bullets that we have. When you start producing bullets that are significantly harder with controlled expansion characteristics, you can get much more penetration out of the same sectional density of a bullet. So all of those things considered, I think the 308 Winchester wins the contest as far as versatility. You have to hand it to them. This will shoot the same bullets pretty much as the 30 out 6. So you can go down to 100 grain, up to 200 grains. Don't know if you'll be able to stabilize a 220, 210. And I don't think it matters because you're really reaching the point of diminishing returns on that 308. But still, that covers a lot of a lot of territory and you can hunt just about anything with it. Whereas with the 270, you're going to find 130 grain, 140 grain, 150 grain bullets. Occasionally there'll be around those 160 out there in the 270. So it's a little bit reduced versatility out of that. But if you're a hand loader, you can go down as low as a 90 grain bullet. I used to load those in a 270 Ruger that I had. <laughs> they were screaming. Uh, great little uh, flat country cartridge uh, bullet combination for pronghorn and coyotes. So hand loaders, of course, always have more versatility. But yeah, overall, Marcus, I think you're right. Enjoy your 270. This doesn't mean that folks who are in love with their 308s are really... Um, too far behind the eight ball because as they well know that cartridge can pretty much do anything they need it to do i don't want to slam anybody's favorite cartridge they do it sometimes just to tweak people but <laughs> but i sure can't fault you for appreciating either one of those they're both great rounds all right hey finally we've come back to north america not only that but the us of a ohio <laughs> weighing in from ohio is todd 
Todd says, hey, I hunt in Ohio, West Virginia, West Virginia and Virginia, and I'm looking for a light, handy, short, 250 yards max in an AR platform rifle. I have a 350 Legend Bolt rifle for Ohio, but I just really enjoy shooting ARs. I have a Model 94, that's the lever action Winchester, in 3030, but my old eyes can no longer handle the open sights, and I cannot bring myself to put a scope on that old rifle. <laughs> Can't blame you there. It sort of ruins the whole uh, effect, doesn't it? Um, so I'm thinking of an AR in 300 hammer. My question is, did Bill Wilson nail that 3030 in an AR quest of his? Is the 300 hammer the best deer pig AR cartridge? Okay. I wouldn't say it's the best deer and uh, pig cartridge, but it might be in the AR platform. So, yeah, I think Mr. Wilson absolutely did nail what he set out to do, which was to make 30-30 performance in an AR but with a pointy bullet, so you actually have better performance. So what his hammer cartridge does is it matches the ballistic, well, at least the velocity of the 3030. Say 2200 to 2400 feet per second, probably 2300 be about right in the dead center. It will do that, but it does it from a 16 and a half inch barrel. Whereas with the 3030, you need at least a 20 inch barrel to get that. So there's a bit of an advantage if you want a really short, light rifle. And a lot of the AR guys do like that. And then, of course, he's got a 150 grain bullet going the same velocity, which we just mentioned. But it's pointed, so it's got a higher ballistics coefficient. It's more aerodynamic. It's going to carry more energy downrange and all the rest of it. So I think he's not only matched it, but he effectively improved the 3030 for an AR. So if that's what you're looking for, by all means, grab it. Now, if it's the best deer and elk cartridge, you've got way too many cartridges out there to, to, to argue with, but I don't think it's a bad choice at all. As anyone who's worked with 3030 over a bunch of years knows, it's darn dependable on deer and hogs. And I've used it on black bears as well, and it, it just does the job. So no problem going with that um 300 hammer. Of course, it is a bottleneck cartridge, so it's probably not going to qualify in a lot of the states that require straight walls, but then neither does the 3030. All right, here is uh, Chris from Kentucky with the creation of all 307 millimeter PRCs. Will the big 33s have competition in the world of big bear hunting? You know, I think they already do and always have. Big bear hunters, uh, gosh, Alaskan brown bears, they've been taking those with 300 magnums of various kinds since before I was coming along. I mean, when I was a kid reading about the adventures of Jack O'Connor and all the big riders back in the day, they were often hunting bears with 300s and 30 out sixes. So, yeah, I don't think that's an issue. Uh, um, I think overall, the 30s and the 7s are taking attention away from all the 33s. It just seems like we have realized that with our new bullets especially, you really don't need the bigger ones because you can drive the narrower ones faster, have a higher sectional density, and uh, do just as well. Um, of course, there are guys who just love a little bit wider bullet. I have never quite bought into this idea that a slight increase in the diameter of your bullet is going to improve significantly your terminal performance because once that bullet lands and expands mushrooms, kind of all bets are off. You know, the sizes of a, a narrower bullet at the start could easily exceed the fatter, wider bullet at the end. And expansion starts as soon as you hit something and that bullet begins to open up and expand because it's maximum energy being applied at that point. And uh, I think you're getting good performance after about three inches in, you pretty much reach your maximum expansion. Um, and at that point, gosh, some of those 30 caliber bullets and even the sevens can exceed the diameter of an expanded 33, especially at higher velocities. So it's a good Really, what you need to do is match the velocity with the anticipated distance of the impact. So your impact energy is what you're you're interested in. So I think it's important for us to study those ballistic charts and tables and know that sort of thing, plus the performance of that particular style of bullet that you're shooting. But I'd have to agree with you that the 33s do have a stiff competition, and they just never have been as popular as the 30s. 
The 35s haven't either. That's not to say the 33s and 35s aren't wonderful. Gosh, that 338 Winchester Magnum, I think, is still pretty much widely accepted as the ultimate all-round elk cartridge and certainly would be the same for moose. But a lot of people just don't like the recoil and, and the weight and the cost and all the rest of it. So... You know, time will tell, but you know, it doesn't really matter what the masses think, what the most popular cartridge is, because it all comes down to individuality. And that's a great thing about being an American, at least, uh, where we really emphasize the individual and personal choices and options, and we grant those to the degree we can. And I think that's what's, what it's all about. If you like a 33 and you're happy with it, who cares what the sevens and the three hundreds are doing? <laughs> Stick with what you like and what works for you. And that's pretty much my advice. And if it makes you happy, so much the better. All right. Here is uh, Jake in Oregon. He's asking something about cartridges. What is your opinion on the 17 Hornady Magnum Rimfire versus the 22 Wind Mag? Boy, that's a good one. I like the 17 HMR a little bit better because it is faster and flatter. And after, mm, I forgot exactly, but about 75, 80 yards, it starts to actually carry more energy at those distances. The 22 mag starts off with more energy, but it's a blunter bullet, wider bullet, much lower BC. Uh, so it starts to run out of steam downrange. Now, it might have been closer to 90 or even 100 yards, but... I like the 17 HMR for a dead on hold to 125 yards. When I used to shoot it a lot, I had it zeroed, I think a half inch high or something at a hundred and it would carry easily to stay inside of a two inch or two and a half inch target diameter at, out to 125 yards, which pretty much meant I could target say a cottontail's head or a squirrel's head out to 125 yards and not have to worry about holding a little bit high or a little bit low or dialing a scope or consulting a different reticle. I could just hold dead on and take them. And that's about the distance at which the energy of the 17 HMR starts to poop out anyway. So it just really made life simple. I could just concentrate on enjoying the hunt and not have to worry about ballistic matters. Whereas the 22 mag, not quite. 100 yards, you start getting a little too much drop in it. But take a look at the different bullets that are out there. They have, may have come out with some more effective bullets in the 22 mag. that are a little bit higher in their BCs. But to my recollection, almost all of the 22 mag bullets that I shot were fairly short, flat. Yeah, they had a sharp tip, but the ogive was pretty quick. And they did not have high BCs. But a lot of people who shoot them swear that inside of 70, 75 yards, they have a lot more significant smack on target. So that's my opinion on it. Well, looks like we had our little fling with folks from the North America because now we're going to New Zealand. <laughs> we're getting around the world in 80 days or 30 minutes, whatever this amounts to. Jonathan, New Zealand. Hey, Ron, I enjoy your podcast and videos. My question is about the Winchester silver tip bullets. I'm a big fan of Winchester, and I was using the big game bullets from Winchester, but we can't get them here anymore. So I got the silver tips. They shoot good. I just, just wounded. What? Don't quite understand why this is. Just wounded if they would be good enough. Oh, wonder. I just wondered if they would be good on longer shots on red stags. So what do you think? So first we have to clarify what a Winchester silver tip is. Because back in the 60s, it was a common cup and core bullet, as much as I know. Correct me if I'm wrong. Common cup and core bullet. I'm sure the jacket was a little bit thicker because it was a hunting bullet. Maybe even been tapered a little bit. But it was called the silver tip because they put an aluminum cap over the exposed lead tip. Back in those days, most of our pointed bullets, our spire points, would have the lead exposed and formed into the fairly sharp point. Not like the sharp tip bullets today, but good enough, but they would get battered, especially in the magazine. Most rifles have a magazine that are, the cartridges are a little bit loose fore to aft. So when recoil happens, those cartridges go banging back and forth inside of that metal box and those lead tips get flatter and flatter and flatter. And I can remember back in the 60s and early 70s, you 
got down to that last round that's been riding in the bottom of the magazine for several shots, and it looked a lot different than the bullet going in. <laughs> it was pretty stub-nosed by that time. And that, of course, reduced your um, ballistics coefficient and changed your precision accuracy because you're dropping more than you would have been otherwise. So Winchester solved it by putting this silver tip on. And I think originally they actually did use silver, but the cost became too prohibitive. So they went with, with a, uh, an aluminum cover over that. How much that actually prevented the nose battering, I don't know. But that was the bullet. And a lot of guys swore by that silver tip. And Winchester, as I remember, had a great marketing campaign with that ballistic silver tip because, of course, what was their uh, mascot? A well, silver tip grizzly, of course. <laughs> so that suggested that that bullet was big, tough, and hard enough to take on a grizzly. Whether or not it was all that effective, I don't know, because cup and core bullet is still a cup and core bullet. I never heard that it was bonded or had any kind of a wall locking it in like a partition bullet or anything like that. So I kind of wonder about that. Now, today they have a ballistic silver tip, which is essentially the Nosler hunting ballistic tip bullet thicker jacket, thicker base um, with a polymer tip on it, but they made it a silver color and they called it the ballistic silver tip. So it's not the same bullet by any stretch. Um, is it effective on stags? I would say it definitely is. Um, I have shot elk with it and they do well. It's not a controlled expansion bullet as far as having bonded walls or any sort of internal construction that locks in a rear lead portion or anything like that. So you do want to worry about your raking shots. You don't want to hit a lot of muscle mass and expect that bullet to go a long way. It could break up. It could overly expand or something. But a good behind-the-shoulder shot, or I think even on the shoulder, shouldn't have any problem uh, penetrating to the vitals on a red stag. They are not as big in the body as our elk, so I don't think you should have any trouble with them. If you like silver tips, ballistic silver tips, uh, and who knows, maybe in Australia, you still have the original silver tips. You're going to have to answer that one for us, Jonathan. But I wanted to get that distinction out there for anyone who's a little bit confused about the names, silver tips. But I think they should work for you. Um, let me know if they don't, but I think a lot of people have used those to good effect. And anyone who's shot the Nosler ballistic tip bullet in a 300 Magnum or any of the bigger loads, let us know how you do on those. That's what I have mostly shot some of my elk and moose and whatnot with. Um, and they did fine with behind the shoulder shots. So I think I could get behind that. All right. That looks like the end of our questions for today, folks. So we are going to wrap it up. Uh, once again, thanking all of our patrons for their support. Really, really important for us. We really appreciate it. And, uh, Thanks to all of you for asking your questions. I see we really didn't have any corrections this week, so I must be getting better. <laughs> At least I didn't screw up on the last one. <laughs> but let us know what you think about uh, everything we talked about today and especially any recipes for that bone marrow. That sounds kind of exciting. We're going to maybe get into that. Hey, until next time, this is Ron Spomer. Stay warm, hunt honest, and shoot straight.